there is mystery and complexity in the one who is the object of our devotion. Good morning. For many people, they do not want mystery, they do not want complexity, they are seeking simple faith. Faith that can be convinced and do a half dozen rules and a handful of pithy sayings. It sounds great, but rarely does such faith speak to the real and often baffling parts of life. Today we're going to explore the nature of God and what it means to speak of God as the Trinity. Three parts, yet one. Multiple expressions of the holy and inseparable nature and purpose of God. That sounds rather complicated by itself. For now, let us offer our songs of praise to the one who is far more than any of us could understand. Yet, in spite of our inability to understand, our faith claims that we are loved beyond measure. Welcome to Cypress Creek. Will you stand and join me? Oh, you are. 
And he came back last night to play a show with me in spring, and I would just love it if you guys would welcome him one more time. You guys are ready to play. So I think it's happening a little bit different today, uh, just to kind of give you guys a chance for us to worship collectively and hear our voices. I think today's going to be a really encouraging and thought provoking word from Bruce. And I wanted to share this song. We've done it once before. It's kind of a corporate worship song, but it means so much to me because it speaks so much to how I feel about God, where I want Him to be present in suffering, and I feel He's not there. I don't understand that. If God, if you are real, why do these bad things happen? And although I don't have an answer for that today, I really wish I did because I feel like it'd be a pretty wealthy man. <laughs> but I think what God is trying to share with me in my time of life is that it is not the absence of suffering, but his presence in it that proves goodness. Sometimes that's hard to hear, and I hope it's not falling on me in our most difficult season. But this is a song that if you can sing it, and what I need as we sing it, I hope it blesses you. If not, you're welcome to just enjoy it. Why don't we take a seat? But I encourage you to sing with us anyway. It's called Shadow Proofs the Sunshine. <laughs> Yeah. 
Good morning. Good morning. Let's give another round of applause for Keaton. I think we can all agree he's gotten a lot better. So good morning and welcome to Cypress Creek Christian Church. If this is your first time, and I know there's at least one guy from Colorado who's the first time today, uh, welcome. And if this is not your first time, glad that you're back. My name is James Seymour, and I am one of the elders here at Cypress Creek, and I will be starting us off with the opening prayer. O Lord, O Lord, you are the God of all people, whether we think we've got you figured out or not. You appear to love us on our worst days, our best days, and every other day. This is great for us, but we are often not ready to extend the same generosity to others. So often we go looking for an uncomplicated and straightforward faith where all the answers can be summed up in a half dozen simple rules. But you, gracious one, cannot fit in the box that we've created, and this world in which we live does not appear to fit neatly in a box either. Calm our spirits, and then invite us into your presence where we can breathe in your unconditional and limitless love. We offer our words of prayer in the name of Jesus, the one who brought to life a love that was rather simple Yet such a love can complicate everything else. Amen. And again, welcome to Cypress Creek. I'm also here to do the announcements. So first of all, Vacation Bible School starts tomorrow. And I know if you want to volunteer, they will find something for you to do. I've done this once. And it was very, very meaningful. And I'm not doing it again. But um, <laughs> yeah, so if you all are up for that, please, please do that. Uh, no. Okay, second announcement is the Bell Choir is on the road. They're out living the Love First Life, bringing the music of the bells. So keep them in your prayers. Uh, next, we have the script cards, which uh, Fred and Cheryl are out before and after service doing. So if you want to go ahead and help your church out by buying a gift card for a store you're already going to go to, please, please do that. And I think that's all of them, correct, Angela? Okay, so I'm going to do the scripture reading as well. Today, on Trinity Sunday, we will focus our attention on two passages of scripture. Both carry the name of John, but one is from the Gospel of John, and the other from the first epistle or letter of John. In the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, we read about Jesus teaching about a mansion with many rooms and how space will be made. Later in the chapter, we find these words beginning with verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will send another companion who will be with you forever. This companion is the spirit of truth whom the world can't receive because it neither sees him nor recognizes him. You know him because he lives with you and will be with you. And then we have these words from the epistle or letter of John 4:16b. God is love, and those who remain in love remain in God, and God remains in them. Here ends the reading. You guys know me for this last song here. Um, I picked this song because, again, as we begin to talk about the Trinity, I think this is beautiful language. And we all, I think, if you grew up in church as I did, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I think you'll recognize it. I'd love to hear you guys sing with me today. Early in the morning, I saw 
you to be seated. I know you've already heard a welcome, but I say welcome again. It is good to be together. And if you're a visitor to Cypress Creek Christian Church, this is a community striving to put love first in all things. It's what we work at here on Sunday morning and other opportunities because once you leave this place, you're going to be challenged to do just that. Well, uh, you saw the picture of our bell choirs. Uh, they're in Beeville, Texas, a uh, little church there. Doesn't have much of a music program. And it's just one way we live the love first life. Both the bell choirs went. They did a concert for them last night for the entire community. And then they're playing in worship this morning. And so we are thankful for all those who went to be a part of that. I'm going to invite our young disciples who are here this morning who would like to join Grace uh, back there. There is a children's church time, and you are more than welcome to go out and hang out. She's got wonderful activities that await you. And as they're headed out, I'm going to invite you to join me in a word of prayer. God, as... 
the voices of little ones are are going out for their own experience, we pray that we too will have an experience, an experience of you. Now bless these words, not only for our own lives, but for how we will choose to live our lives for the sake of the larger community. It is in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Growing up, I liked Batman. Actually, growing up, uh, well, before I was actually born, my name was supposed to be Bruce Wayne Froge. <laughs> Uh, Wayne being a family name, my parents were not a fan of Batman. But my brother, about two months before I was born, shared the news that Bruce Wayne was Batman's secret identity, and my mother changed it to Bruce David Froge. But I grew up on Batman. I loved the comics. I bought a lot of those. I was into the original TV series with Adam West and Burt Ward original Batman and Robin. But about the time I started buying comics, I was into the villain, specifically the one called Two-Face. And you see a picture of him there on the screen. He started uh, much earlier than even Batman. He was in another series inspired by Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But I loved this character, because literally he had a good side and a bad side. There was a beautiful side and a terrifying side. And it was one of the places that if you were a comic book reader, that you begin to see something happening in the storyline. Suddenly the heroes were not always as perfect as you thought they were going to be. They had flaws. And the villains? They were not always as evil as you expected them to be, which complicated things. But I also liked it, because it began to add some depth to what had been a rather flat storyline in the comic books. But this notion of two sides, two faces, good, bad, righteous, unrighteous, goes back further than modern-day storytelling. If you look at the Roman god Janus, or Janus, depending on how you pronounce it, you see a picture of it there on the screen. Janus was the Roman god of thresholds. And it makes sense because it's where we get our word January. It is the month that is at a threshold. One face is looking back. One is looking forward. But it's more complicated than that. Janus was associated with the feelings of guilt and grief over past events, but also with feelings of hope and optimism in regard to the future. It was this that way or this way, past or future, backward or forward. This notion of ancient gods having two sides, two faces, was not all that unusual. Greek philosophy, the very Roman, uh, the philosophy associated with the Roman Empire of Jesus' day and of the New Testament writers, they emphasized a strict duality, strict binary. It is either this way or that way. It's either right or it's wrong. It is good or it's bad. Or you can even say, we are in sacred space. But as soon as you exit this place, you are in unholy space. That was the language used. But people who are willing, and I hope that's you all, to bring different eyes to not only the Hebrew scriptures, or what we call the Old Testament, and the Christian scriptures, or what we call the New Testament, I think what you will find is that much of Scripture does not fit neatly and perfectly into this way or that way. In fact, in the Jewish faith, they present what is often described as a plurality within the nature of God. Now that sounds heady. It's not polytheism, it's not multiple gods, 
But there was this sense that there was complexity to the nature of God. And even if you look at the Hebrew poem that is Genesis 1, we read that God said, let us make humanity in our image. And so God created humanity in God's own image. In the divine image, you see it there on the screen now, The divine image, God created them. Male and female, God created them. Our image? Who's this our that it's talking about in the ancient Jewish faith? Some translators, in fact, did not like what they found in Genesis 1. They did not, it did not fit their very narrow understanding of God. And so they went on to suggest and translate it as, in fact, that only men were created in the image of God. Women, not so much. But the text, the poetry of Genesis 1 is clear. And then you begin to think about its time. Thousands of years ago, this is surprising. This is unexpected. This is intriguing. It's complicated. There is depth and breadth and profoundness found in that image of God. And yet, the church has often tried to streamline and consolidate, pushing the nature of God and faith and the life of faith back into a well-controlled, defined box. God is this and not that. Faith is this and not that. Life is to be lived this way and not that way. Some very well-defined binaries. In the introduction to a new book entitled Leaving and Finding Jesus, the person who writes the introduction, Joel Clark, writes this. This is a dangerous book. Industry and empire have been built upon the lie of separation, the lie of us versus them, of in or out. I'm intrigued by that language, the lie of separation. And yet it has taught, among other things, that ministers, that'd be me, That ministers, we do sacred work. You all, you live in the secular world. Us ministers, what we do is the good stuff. You all, not so much. Now, I find that to be utter nonsense. What you do, whether it's what you did or what you are currently doing, if it helps to put bread on the table, if it gives you a sense of purpose, if you felt, whether it's with your head or your heart or your hands, that you have helped someone, I'm going to suggest that that is sacred. Maybe even more sacred than what I do. In our scripture this morning, the passage specifically from John's Gospel, Jesus provides us really beautiful language here, and yet the teaching, just in a few verses, is sort of complicated. Jesus starts off, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Okay. And then he goes on to say, I will ask the Father, and he will send another companion who will be with you forever. This companion is the Spirit of Truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor recognizes him. You know him because he lives with you and will be with you. Now, this is not a well-structured argument for the Trinity. The idea of a triune God, that God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. And yet there's some interesting interplay going on here. There is God the Father. There is Jesus who we assume is the original companion in the flesh 
Thinking back to John 1, where we learn that the Word was with God and the Word took on flesh and lived or dwelt among us. And then there is this new companion, which is the Spirit of Truth that will be with us always. Suddenly, God has some complexity. God isn't just known this way or that way. There is more to God than what people might have thought previously. Greek philosophy and religion had gods with two faces, two personas. But suddenly the early church, I think birthed out of, out of Judaism, that saw the nature of God having a plurality, begin to speak about God in such a way that there was multiple ways of thinking about God, using metaphor and images. One God whose nature is amazingly complex and diverse. It gets complicated. And for some people, that's a problem. I find it to be liberating. We in Christianity have this really bad habit of thinking that we've got this whole God thing figured out. I mean, how complex could it be? I mean, we're only talking about the essence of life and love, the ground of all being, the eternal one. I mean, we can all summarize that in a paragraph or two, right? Yeah. Or not. A friend of ours came to visit us when we were living in Florida. She had been a church kid. In fact, she was a PK, a preacher's kid. She was also an adult who was part of church, or had been. She'd been a youth sponsor. She'd been a camp counselor. She was an all-around amazing human being. But she'd kind of fallen away from church. And she was the one that articulated it for me really well. The unintended consequences of thinking that this God thing and this Christian living thing is simple and either fits in this category or that category, as if, as if it can be packaged in this dualism, as if following Jesus is just really simple. You just need to step into this one box and then you'll have it. She was the one that, as we were sitting on the beach one afternoon, who said, I don't fit. I'm complicated. She said the church I had been attending had a list of what a great, good Christian looked like. And she said, if I was honest, I might have been able to check 25% of those boxes. And yet I didn't know a better human being, a more faithful person. I don't know about you, but I'm complicated. There are a lot of things about me that do not fit neatly in some sort of manufactured understanding of what it means to be, you know, a good Christian person. I believe that God is infinitely more complex than anything we can imagine. And if you and I are created in the image of this God, then isn't that image that rests upon us complex? non-cookie cutter. And yet, sadly, we've got a lot of people saying, oh, no, no, it's this way, not that way. You've got to fit this box, not that box. Mariah, in just over a week, will be headed out to direct church camp. I remember doing middle school camp as the director, gosh, about 20 years ago. And we had planned for one of the night activities was an all-camp simulation game. We had been prepping for it. We had all these pieces that we needed to have. And it really, when the youth arrived at the basketball course, this big concrete area, they found a bunch of boxes that I had taped off, big boxes, squares. Some of them touched, some of them were far apart. They were given a card and they were assigned to a box. On your card said the name of your group if you were inside that box. It told you what the values you held if you were in that box. And then 
each person in your group had some different opinions about the other boxes. We had this whole thing planned out about how we were going to ask questions and get them engaged and hopefully let them see about the tent come of that. But I kid you not, 30 seconds into this well-planned, well-structured simulation game, one of the kids responds to a question that he was supposed to answer based upon the card he was given. Follow the rules. But he broke character. And he says, holding up the card, why do I have to believe this? Just because you said so? Well, well that's, that's the game. Well, maybe that's the problem. He says, we've allowed ourselves to play a stupid game with all kinds of stupid rules that make absolutely no sense and leave a lot of people out. I've got an idea, he says. How about we play by a, ga a game with just one rule, and that rule being love? And I, I couldn't have even imagined it, but suddenly there was this complete and utter rebellion of about 125 middle schoolers <laughs> as they begin to leap outside of their well-defined boxes and they begin to rip the tape up. I spent hours putting down that tape. They didn't want to play the game. And maybe there was something to be learned there. We have been handed a bunch of rules that say this is the right way and that's the wrong way. This is what it means to be good and this is what it means to be bad. This is what it, and I don't know about you, but I think I sort of stand sometimes in both worlds. There's parts of me and what some people say is bad, I think in fact might be good in life giving. It just scares them. I got a line down here. You maybe noticed it. You'll notice it when you come forward for communion. And because I like goofy things, I bought some big pencils. There's some more up here. And I'm going to invite you, you can go back to that picture if you want. I'm going to invite you, not during communion, but after worship, I'm going to invite you to come down here and pretend like you're racing the line. Because there's a little gap here in the middle. And I'm going to invite you to have somebody take a picture of you. About how we erase the lines. Some of them that have been imposed upon us by others, but... Some that we've sometimes imposed upon ourselves. Lines that should never have existed in the first place. And then I invite you to post this on social media. Talk about erasing lines. We're going to be talking about this for the next few weeks here at Cypress Creek. Basing it on this idea that so often we think living faith is lived in this strict dualism. And then you begin playing around with the Bible. And you find that those categories rarely fit. In fact, there is great complexity to Scripture. And Jesus shows up and faces a bunch of people who liked lines. And he began to erase them. It got him in trouble. In fact, it got him killed. But there's something powerful about that witness especially if you were one of the people standing on the outside, to have someone who erases the line and in fact says, that line has nothing to do with God. It has to do with people's insecurities. It has to do with people not understanding. It has to do with people not willing to take a risk. Somebody's got to erase the lines. And I think in part it's what we are called to do. So you got some pencils up here. After worship, take a picture. Let your friends know that we're going to be erasing some lines over the next few weeks. You join me in prayer. Oh God of us and them who not only seems to blur lines, but seems to be about the work of erasing and eradicating all the lines that, that religion and other power structures seem to like. Come among us this day with, ama with your amazing complexity and allow for us to see you anew. 
So often we are told, this is what God is like. This way only. And if that's what we're expecting, I have a feeling there's a lot of who you are that we miss. You are the one that has never fit anyone's preconceived notions. You're the one that seems to break it all open. Call upon us as those who claim to be the body of Christ in this moment of time. Call upon us to do as Jesus did and start erasing these lines that have divided and separated and broken this world in ways that you never imagined. And sadly, it has been religion at the forefront. And yet Jesus, this amazing gift, is for us a mentor and our model. May we learn from him, may we be empowered through him to do this good work. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. I intentionally put the line where it is between you and the communion table. Because trust me when I say there's a lot of people who want to draw a line between you and the communion table and tell you why you can't step over that line, why you are not welcome at this table, why it is that you're not good enough And then Jesus shows up and does exactly what he did throughout his life and ministry. He makes sure that there is room at the table for all. And so I'm going to invite you when you come forward for communion here in a few minutes to ignore this line. Maybe that's what we need to be about. People who ignore and just pretend it doesn't exist. And maybe take somebody by the hand who is feeling intimidated by that line and show them that, in fact, the line has no power when it comes to the beckoning grace of God that says, come and feast, come and share. Here at Cypress Creek Christian Church, we celebrate communion every week because we believe there is something powerful that happens at the table. I, people will say, shouldn't the sermon come at the end? And I always say, I don't want to end with something I do. I want to end with something God. Because a sermon, sometimes it can stink. But I've never been disappointed with the table. The grace that is put on display there is immeasurable and powerful and transformative. So know today that you are welcome to come and share in this meal. We have communion as we were doing throughout the pandemic. And I even up until a few weeks ago in the little one in containers or if you want we started a few just last week actually where you can take a piece of bread it's unleavened bread take a piece and dip it into the cup the chalice as i said last week don't dip your fingers or your whole hand into the juice just the end of the bread and then go ahead and partake if you take one of these we invite you as soon as you get to your seats to go ahead and partake let us now prepare our hearts and minds for this experience where there is grace and love that abound. Thank you.
As members of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, at the table of the Lord, we celebrate with thanksgiving the saving acts and presence of Christ. For Cypress Creek Christian Church, communion is open to all believers, regardless of age, religious tradition, or experience, or the condition of one's spirit. The Last Supper reminds us that we are all forgiven and part of the family of Christ. Echoing the Passover feast, Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took an ordinary loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took a cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Holy Father, at this table, we have no boundaries, and all are welcome. Just as our Lord created each one of us to be on this earth, today our lives seem to be complicated, and we choose to find ways that makes us comfortable, forgetting about the others who do not walk along our side. In our community, many need the care and love as our Lord taught us to serve all. Let us begin the week with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Lord in heaven, table is set. Please come.
have already noticed some sleepy eyes around this place. <laughs> Last night, a lot of us were at a performance. Coulter and Keaton, uh, Coulter's band uh, played, and then Keaton played, and uh, uh, it's so funny. It, yeah, you can it was, it was, they, were, they were at do si the big barn, and it was a great night. I, I, I thought it was funny, after it was all over, I kind of came in on a conversation, and someone said, I wonder if he'll be able to make it there in the morning. And I said, who are you talking about? And they said, well, you. They were talking about me. <laughs> I didn't know quite how to take that, but it was, it was a great night. And, you know, when I talk about how, you know, so often... You know, the work of the church is deep, you know, the, the good stuff, the holy stuff. And what happens outside of communion is choking me up. <clears throat> uh, what happens outside of here is not. But, I mean, last night, I mean, it was just a joyful celebration. Great music, laughter, fun. How can that not be sacred and what God is about? Uh, what you know you all do in your day-to-day -day lives shopping at the grocery store can be a sacred experience and yet so often we want to put firm lines that divide this is this is sacred that's not so I hope that you will be about the work of erasing some of those lines a couple of quick things the elders are meeting immediately after worship today uh, they're meeting while Vacation Bible School people are setting up. A lot of stuff happening here in a little bit. Tomorrow is Gringo Spirit Day. If you don't know what that is, the Gringos right here, close to Cypress, or close to the church here. Am I pointing in the right direction? Not really. That direction. Uh, Twenty percent of everything you buy comes back to the church. And we've done all kinds of stuff with this, outreach, stuff like that. If you don't know, um, Center Point, all day long, yes, lunch and dinner. Center Point Energy uh, caused a massive energy surge to our property, thousands of dollars damaged air, air conditioners, elevators, stuff. Insurance is involved, but this time the money from Spirit Day is going to help us deal. A little bit with all of that damage because we're talking tens of thousands of dollars of damage done and uh, not a whole lot we can do about it so it is what it is but this will be a good way of bringing a little bit of money so it's a great time um, people will be there all day I'll be there in the evening so if you want to come out and hang out with me that'd be marvelous and then finally coming up uh, a little later in June there is going to be a water day yes a water day June 22nd from 6 to 7 30 here on the campus if you are not into water slides, that's okay. We need you here. This one, we're wanting this to be an intergenerational evening. So come and be part of it. There's going to be games. There's going to be silliness. We need people to help if you'd be willing to grill or to help set up. Uh, there are sign-up sheets that so you can do so just outside the sanctuary. You can let Mariah know as well. Um, but again, I hope you'll come and be a part of it. I do not plan to go on the water slide. I'll blow out a hip if I do that. But... Um, I plan to be here and to enjoy the evening. As we do every week, we extend an invitation as we bring our service to a conclusion, an invitation to connect one's life, not only with this community of faith, but to connect one's life with Jesus Christ. And today, if you wish to respond to that invitation, you can come forward as we are singing this final song, or you can meet with me or one of our elders, you can meet with James, you can meet with Esau, immediately after the service. We'd love to have that conversation with you. I'm going to invite you now, whether it is in body or spirit or both, to rise and let us join our voices.
picture down here racing the line after worship now let us join together in our closing prayer what sure a anybody i want lots of pictures <laughs> do it let's do the prayer that should be on the screen any moment there it is gracious god May your love and our lives come together in a life lived in love. May Jesus be our mentor and our model. And may the world see in us a life that is willing to put love first in all things. 